Dog, you smell bad. Goodness gracious. Hey, welcome to Surf Safe Chapter 2. This is Chef Bates, and it's time to talk about biological contaminants and fat time. Now, over the course of the next 12 minutes, we're going to talk about the four pathogens which can lead to the spread of a foodborne illness. And we'll explain what that means in just a minute. Uh, we're also going to go over the conditions that affect the growth of foodborne bacteria, also known as fat tom. Three terms you got to know. Microorganism, pathogen, and toxin. A microorganism, a tiny, tiny, tiny little living thing that can only be seen with a microscope. Now, if that tiny living thing gets into your food and makes you sick, it's called a pathogen. If it gets into your food and creates a poison, it can be called a pathogen. And that poison that it's producing is called a toxin. So microorganism, pathogen, toxin. Three terms. Got to know all three of them. Many viruses, bacteria, and parasites can cause an illness, but you can't see them or smell them or taste them. That what makes them so difficult to stop. On the other hand, some fungi, like mold, can change the look, smell, or taste it, but may not make you sick, <laughs> well, which is interesting. Uh, there's some fungi that make some amazing yogurt, and there's some mold that makes some amazing cheese. All fungi are not bad. All bacteria are not bad. Oh, the viruses and parasites, they're all gross. <laughs> How does a person, a food handler, somebody who works in a restaurant, get people sick by contaminating food? They do it in four ways. Number one, the most, the grossest way, and by far the most common way is by not washing their hands after using the restroom. Now, I am sure you have seen those studies where how poop molecules are all over everything. If you go to the bathroom, you make a number two, you don't um, wash your hands after wiping, and then you go and make someone a salad, not only are you just so gross and so nasty and, oh, ugh, but you're probably passing on some contamination. You don't actually have to uh, be that disgusting to contaminate food. You can just be in contact with a person who's sick, and their illness, because bacteria are just so infectious, and viruses are so infectious, they can get it onto you just by you being in contact with them. If you sneeze or, God save us all, vomit in the kitchen, you can be contaminating a bunch of surfaces. Or if you touch a dirty food contact surface and then go touch some food. And that's gross. Really gross? Once again, you're nasty. A lot of these mistakes are pretty simple. If you allow ready-to-eat food, food that can just go directly you know, from the kitchen onto the plate and into somebody's mouth, all ready to eat food. If it touches a surface that's been, you know, there's raw meat has been on it or seafood or poultry, that's cross-contamination. Super easy way for food to become contaminated. If you don't store food or cleaning products correctly, goodness gracious, that's another easy way. A lot of students don't realize is not being on the lookout for signs of pests, roaches, mice droppings, rat droppings, um, ugh, gross. Uh, bacteria live in and on our bodies. They're practically everywhere. You can't see them. You can't smell them. You can't taste them. Uh, we'd have to take you right now to a lab and do a skin scraping, put it under a microscope just to see what kind of bacteria are on you. And there's a lot of bacteria on you right now. Here's the thing about bacteria. They grow really, really fast if fat tom conditions are correct. So all that means that if everything is, is perfect for bacteria, they'll double in number every 20 minutes. Keep that number in mind. Every 20 minutes, they will double up. How do you stop them? There's only one way. Control time and temperature. You can't control anything else about how they grow. All you can control is time and temperature. On the other hand, viruses, they're kind of like bacteria, they're on you, but uh, they don't grow in food. They're not multiplying in food like bacteria do. They treat food kind of like an Uber, as some way to get from one place to another place. People get viruses from food, water, or contaminated surfaces. And foodborne illnesses from viruses um, typically are coming through the fecal-oral route. Again, that really gross, you know, poop to mouth. Ugh. They're not destroyed by cooking temperatures. So bacteria we can kill if we get it hot enough. <laughs> Viruses, not so much. You also don't kill them by freezing them. The only way to stop viruses is by practicing good personal hygiene. 
wash your dang hands. Parasites. <laughs> most people are grossed out the most by parasites, even though they get the fewest number of people sick. Because parasites are small living animals. And they live in a host. They live in the host. They reproduce in the host. And you, my friend, can be the host of a parasite. You probably are right now and don't know it. Parasites that get into food are commonly associated most frequently with seafood. But they also show up in wild game like venison, deer, uh, wild turkey, wild duck, or food that's been processed with contaminated water like uh, produce like lettuce, romaine lettuce especially. Now here, here's the thing. You can kill the parasite, the living parasite, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're killing its eggs. And seafood parasites, they can be destroyed by freezing. So if you freeze salmon or tuna for, I think it's four days, at, I think it's 15 degrees below zero, then you'll kill the parasite, which is good. But you're not necessarily killing the eggs and you're not removing the parasites. Maybe you're still eating a worm. The best defense against parasites is always to purchase your food from an approved vendor. When we're talking about the symptoms of a foodborne illness, what will happen if you eat this? There's basically six symptoms. And the first one, the most common one, look at the picture, take a guess, diarrhea. Second most common is vomiting. Third, fever. Nausea is when you feel like you're gonna throw up. See how the little guy's got his hand over his mouth and his hand on his belly? He thinks he's gonna puke, that's nausea very, very common symptom of foodborne illness and abdominal cramping, which is not where you think you want to uh, throw up, but rather that you've got a intense pain in your stomach. And understand the symptoms of foodborne illness vary depending on which foodborne illness you picked up. But most victims of foodborne illnesses have all of these symptoms. There's one last symptom of foodborne illness that is linked to just one thing, and that is jaundice. Jaundice is linked to only hepatitis A, which is a virus. It attacks your liver and it gives your eyes a, a dark yellow tint and your skin a dark yellow tint because your liver isn't working. Hepatitis A is very, very common. Kind of terrifying, actually, how common it is. When we're talking about onset times, what we're really talking about is how long from when you eat, uh, you consume that pathogen to when you get sick. It can range from 30 minutes, it can all the way up to six weeks and longer. People get sick today and they say it's because of what I ate earlier today. That's very rarely the case. Usually it's something they ate a couple days ago. It would be wise for us to take a, a pause here and talk about the big six. The big six pathogens. The first four of these are bacteria. The last two are viruses. Bacteria wise, we got Salmonella typhi, we got Shigella SPP, we got non-typhoidal salmonella, also sometimes referred to just as NTS. We have Shiga toxin producing Escherichia coli. We call it E. coli, right? But it's Escherichia coli. It isn't the E. coli itself that makes you sick, but it's the toxin, the Shiga toxin that makes you sick. It's pretty much usually known as just STEC, STEC. Hepatitis A is a virus and norovirus is a virus. So we got four bacteria, two viruses. These are the majority of the things that are making people sick all around the world. Now, they have some commonalities. They are almost always found in people's poo. <laughs> if you are sick with one of these bacteria or those two viruses, it's going to be in your feces. And the way you're going to transmit it to another person is the oral fecal route, not washing your hands thoroughly after you make a poo. Uh, they can be transferred to food very easily. And the thing about all six of these is even a very small dose can make a person very, very, very sick. Very sick. Bacteria have some things that are in co they, they just have in common. All of our bacteria, those first four bacteria, they are almost everywhere. <laughs> they can't be seen or smelled or tasted. They grow really, really fast if fat tom conditions are right. And they can produce toxins as they grow and die. And the toxin is the poison that makes you sick, like in Escherichia coli. To prevent foodborne illnesses from bacteria, you got one solution, control time and temperature. Put that in your head, stick it there forever. If you want to keep people from getting sick from a bacteria, you have to be very careful about time and temperature. Bacteria need 
six specific things to grow fast. Uh, the first is, uh, to collectively, it's called fat tom. Food, acidity, temperature, time, oxygen, moisture. The first of these six items is food. And we're not going to get into the specifics of the type of carbohydrates and protein and sugar levels they need to grow well. Just know they need food. Acidity, they want food that is almost neutral and slightly acidic. Remember that and you're golden. Almost neutral, slightly acidic. So in other words, just under seven, which is perfectly neutral. Foods that they would not like, lemons, limes, tomatoes, uh, even things like mayonnaise. Those are very acidic pro uh, products. They're not going to like that. Um, now milk, on the other hand, uh, raw chicken, dude, they're setting up a tent. Temperature is probably one, it's the first of the things that we can control because we know where bacteria grow fast. They grow fast in temperatures that are well, pretty much the same kind of temperatures you like. The temperature danger zone is 41 degrees to 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Memorize that. Memorize it. It's not that hard. 41 to 135. The other number range that you need to memorize is where they grow really fast. 70 to 125. 70 to 125, they grow even more rapidly. You go above that number, above 135, you go below 41, and bacteria growth may continue, but it's going to be really, 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 really slow. Bacteria growth is limited when food is held above or below. Bacteria also need time. They don't instantly grow. They need time to spend in the temperature danger zone. We need to limit the amount of time that our food sits in that danger zone so that the bacteria doesn't have a chance to start, you know, doubling every 20 minutes. Some bacteria need oxygen. Some bacteria don't like oxygen. <laughs> oh, but most, most need oxygen. They're aerobic bacteria. Uh, the way I remember this is when I do aerobics, I breathe a lot. And when I don't do aerobics, I don't breathe a lot. Maybe that'll help you. So the last thing that bacteria need to grow on the fat tom scale is moisture. Bacteria grow really well in food with high levels of moisture. Now, when we're talking about moisture, one of those weird things that you're supposed to know for syrup safe is how water is measured, the water activity level in food. And that's measured with an A with a tiny little W, a subscript. Uh, the AW is water activity. And that is the amount of available water in food. And the AW scale, it ranges from 0, 0.0 up to 1.0. And with 0, 0.0 being completely dry, completely dried out beef jerky, up to 1.0, which is a nice glass of water. Mm. You can't control how much water is in food. You can't control uh, the acidity level of your chicken. You can't control the oxygen that's available and some lemon preserves you're making. All you can control is time, how long that TCS food is going to spend in the temperature danger zone. And you can control temperature by keeping foods that need to be refrigerated in the refrigerator until you're going to cook them and then immediately cooking them. We'll get into the specifics of how you control temperature later on. But for right now, the two things you can control, time and temperature. The other things you can't control, food, acidity, oxygen, and moisture. The only way, the only way to stop or slow the infection of food by bacteria is to control the fat dominant conditions. Mm -hmm.